Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us and being with us as we continue these conversations that we've been having uh, throughout the Financial Innovation Summit. I'm really glad uh, to be joined by one of two men who are going to be talking with me for the next few minutes uh, behind Chia, which touts itself as a more sustainable, faster, and secure blockchain platform. Right now with me is David Frazee. He is a managing partner of Richmond Global Ventures, and he is also a board member of Chia Networks. David, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, David, let's just start here. For people who may not know, what exactly is Chia and how does it differentiate itself from other blockchain platforms? Sure. Well, it may help to step back and ask the bigger question about what does blockchain need to look like in order to power large sections of the economy in 20 years? Because that is definitely where we're going. And a lot of the current blockchains have certain deficiencies that make it hard for national governments, for multinational institutions, central bankers, uh, corporations, and, and others to adopt it. So Chia was essentially designed asking the question, what would Bitcoin look like if we could redesign it today? And what will be necessary to power trillions of dollars of the world economy in the financial services sector, asset sector, and adjacents? So Chia has focused first upon sustainability. So Chia uses, depending upon how you measure, one three hundredth to one ten thousandth of the energy of, say, Bitcoin, which is important for the long-term sustainability of a blockchain. It, use, it fixes a number of the security flaws and security issues with other blockchains, and it's built uh, by the world's, I think, you know, best distributed network architect, Bram Cohen, who built BitTorrent. It has uh, compliance built into it, both in the sense it has never itself been an illegal securities offering, like a number of tokens and coins out there, and enables compliance, which is important for larger institutions. Peer-to-peer -peer transfer, maybe that isn't so important, but the ability, if you're the CFO of a Fortune 20 company, to have auditable, traceable transactions that are compliant with Sarbanes-Oxley and the highest accounting standards. And similarly, if you're a national government, to have auditable, traceable transactions is absolutely crucial. Uh, it's programmable, meaning that it has all of the capacity to build applications and services, because you have to understand, when we think of blockchain, people think of cryptocurrencies and, you know, get rich quick, 20 year olds out trading and talking about, you know, different coins, but it's really the rails of the new economy. It's the underlying infrastructure that permit the exchange of money, goods, assets, and their adjacents, which ultimately come the internet of markets across all markets. So it has to have programmability and the capacity to create different uh, applications on it. And finally, you know, it's public and it's equitable. It's an open source project. Anyone can create a node and be a farmer. So it's inclusive in that sense. It doesn't require hundreds of thousands of dollars of specialized computer equipment that you have to have for other cryptocurrencies and other blockchains. And the applications that will ultimately be built on these rails, I believe, will have an important effect on the middle and working class of the world in enabling their access equitably to financial services and products that uh, are not foreclosed to them today, but are prohibitively expensive or slow or have intermediaries uh, that add a lot of friction to the process. And I'd, I'd love to bring in, uh, we saw Gene Hoffman uh, pop into here. He is uh, the second person joining us. It, uh, Gene is president and chief operating officer of Chia Networks. Gene, can you just build on what David just said? I mean, how were you actually able to do that? Did you ask yourself, you know, if, if you could rebuild Bitcoin, what would you do? Um, what went into sort of Chia? Yeah, it was very much looking at the state of the art 11 years after Bitcoin. And we started about four years ago. This was not a short project in that sense. And it was taking a disciplined approach. You know, one of the things we didn't do is do an ICO in 2017. Uh, you know, Bram certainly could have, uh, being one of the most famous protocol engineers out there. Instead, it was, okay, what are what is the state of the art? What are the real problems? And in fact, you know, Bram invented new math in three different places on our product roadmap to really be able to deliver the technology that's necessary to answer some of these hard problems. Uh, you know, in 2009, Bitcoin kind of didn't have a sense of what would the application layer look like. And no one really had a sense about how you might go to market and fund development. You know, one of the things to me that's been sad about the Bitcoin development story is it's been begware to some extent. You know, it's developers out there saying, hey, the new guys, you know, you should donate to them. And it's, you know, a kind of 
troubling situation where people were making millions of dollars while the actual developers there were were not getting paid. And, and so backing up to your point, you know, we really looked at the three major flaws. We looked at sustainability because, you know, if Bram and I were able to deploy internet money and the rails for financial infrastructure globally, that that is the promise, you end up using something like 20% of the world's baseband power. And, and that's exactly the long legacy, right? Uh, we also think that blockchain should have gotten product market fit in 2017, but we think that the early adopters took a look at the offerings and at the time that was really Ethereum and its Solidity programming environment and said, you know, we can't have the risks that we see out of the DeFi infrastructure on Ethereum. You know, $113 million last week was lost. Uh, you know, this week, I think it was $20 million. This was not something that the CIO of a major bank, the you know head of information tech at uh, NGO or multilateral could accept. Well, so how, though, do you actually measure um, those green components that you were talking about, being sustainable and being equitable? Uh, because, of course, that is something that, um, you know, we're talking about, especially during COP. But how is it that you're actually measuring that and, and ensuring that you are providing a, an opportunity um, that other platforms are not? Gene? Well, you know, I will say... I will say there's no such thing as a free lunch. So there is some energy used to be able to get the security that Bitcoin also has, right? But I, I like using uh, Hoover dams. Uh, it takes 28 Hoover dams to run Bitcoin annually, okay? And you know, if you think about Hoover dam, that's a large amount of power. Right now, to run the Chia network, it takes 6% of a Hoover dam. So if we had 15 times the size of our already 40 exabyte network, it would be one Hoover dam's worth of annual power consumption. And you know it compares well to the banking infrastructure, to the New York Stock Exchange, to Visa and MasterCard. When you add those things together, and those are the things that fundamentally are going to ride on the rails of a you know enterprise class blockchain, it's actually as well or better, but it's much more secure. And that goes to your second part of your question. Bitcoin at its peak had 210,000 full nodes. Um, it is now around 65,000 full nodes on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. At our peak earlier this year, we hit around 750,000 full nodes and currently have between 300,000 and 400,000 full nodes. Uh, really important for two reasons. I mean, first of all, to be clear, we are now the largest public blockchain ever. Um, you know, it goes to the point that we are massively globally distributed. I mean, if you want to know where our nodes are, you kind of compare GDP and internet access globally. And, you know, that's really why we can sort of firmly say that you've got that more security. You know, you've got to go convince 200,000 node runners that they should change the rules of the road. And, and that's what's really led to, you know, the news we're talking about today. Yeah, and I, I want to talk to you both about some of that news. Um, you have just announced, you're announcing today about um, the World Bank Partnership, which sort of goes in line with what Chia is touting. Talk about uh, about that and sort of um, how that is going to have an effect on, um, you know, lowering emissions, which we're all trying to strive for. Yeah, this is a really interesting program by the World Bank. We're really excited to be a technology partner to them with, you know, the entire world, frankly. It's creating a public good, which is the climate warehouse. And the idea behind the climate warehouse is to create a, you know, and I love blockchain this way, decentralized, centralized database. So the idea is that every nation's carbon registry, every existing carbon registry can come together in a single place, be able to report the kind of history of carbon credits, and then be able to track and audit them as they're retired over time to really address the double spend issues. You know, has this carbon credit been retired twice? You know, can we make these markets now cross nation and cross border? And we will be continuing to work on that with some additional announcements we'll be making over the next month or two. But the whole hope here is, is you know, all of the great things about a blockchain. I mean, it's permissionless. So, you know, individual nations, individual carbon registries kind of have equal footing inside that. It's using a new piece of technology we call data layer, which allows you to have kind of a set of federated databases where say one country owns one table in that database. And so that's where they're gonna update and change their carbon credit counts. But everyone else can see when they update and cryptographically prove that they're downloading the right update from each of the databases and all stay in the sync. What's on chain is just the audit material. So the chain publicly, you know, continues to be able to be easy to be synced to 400,000 people. But then in the background, they're going to create websites and other things where you can really programmatically guarantee that, yes, this is country X's entire carbon registry. These are the changes over time.
Yeah, and it's and important. David, I'm, yeah, I'd love for you to jump in. And I was just going to say, there's been some criticism, though, about carbon credits specifically. So where where does blockchain sort of fit in here as to sort of pushing us closer to becoming greener? Well, one well, thing I was going to say. say yeah, go ahead, David. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was going to say, this the, is actually the whole important. <laughs> David, we can start with Late. you. We have latency, so that's that's for those watching. Um, I was going to say this is actually a very important story because this is the largest asset-based application of blockchain so far in history, and there are a number of announcements coming up that will actually supersede this, but this is an important basis for a number of applications and services that can be built. Jean can speak more eloquently here, but among the issues with carbon credit specifically, as Gene alluded to, some of the double spin, the trust among nations uh, with each other, having a distributed database, which is ultimately is what blockchain is, that is verifiable, auditable, traceable, reliable, is an important first step to ensure that everyone can have Paris compliance in a way that is is trustworthy and it and eliminates, frankly, a lot of the charlatans and a lot of the the, the fraud that happens in these markets. Gene, I'd, I'd like to turn it back to you. Yeah, you know, the whole point here is to build reputation and then to enable kind of cross-border trade. Today, you know, a, a California carbon credit is really kind of only valid in like California and Quebec. And, and that's in fact, kind of sad because it turns out that California carbon credits aren't the types of ones that are you know, susceptible to the frauds. So the whole idea here is that you have a public database, a public record, where the individual nations and registries are peers in that data, data set, and they're sharing that data publicly so everyone can validate it, audit it, go dig down into the shape file, the pictures of the trees, and see that, no, this isn't being greenwashed. This really is someone who went out and planted another 100 acres of, of actual carbon sequestration trees. And is that a little bit how you see this um, functioning once it's up and running and operational? And, and how far out are, are we from actually seeing that? So it is right now still a second prototyping stage. So they've run previous kind of simulations, but this one expects to be a bit larger. The difference is we hope together with them that this may be the kind of final solution to this problem and maybe a few additional options to make uh, identity management and some of the ways that you'll kind of handle the data set itself simpler. But this is very much a near-term opportunity. Um, you know, the, the uh, World Bank said that this was originally a six-year program that they're three years into, and they feel like the Chia blockchain can take three years out of that project. Hmm. And I'd love to talk to both of you. I mean, we were speak, speaking the other day, and you, you said that blockchain uh, is going to be the biggest financial story in 20 years, right? But who is going to end up being successful? I mean, what is it going to take? Um, because there's a number of platforms out there. What do you think are, are, are the keys to, to making this work and having it stick and making it be equitable, as both of you have sort of alluded to? David, maybe we start with you. Yeah, I mean, and let me just give my perspective. So I'm not here to say Chia is going to be the winner, but I do think that what Chia has built is now the new table stakes. Everyone has to do at least this in order to move forward. And it goes back to what I first said. We, we've been looking, I mean, as investors at blockchain for over a decade. And our thesis has always been blockchain's absolutely going to win. Bitcoin won't be the winner and, and a lot of the current entrants won't be the winner because they don't check the boxes of, again, what the real customers who power the economy need, the multinationals, financial institutions, governments. And peer-to-peer -peer transfer matters, but you have to build something that can have wide scale adoption. And if you're a national government or you're a CFO of a Fortune 10 company, you, again, you can't use a blockchain that's done illegal securities offerings because among other things, they may be shut down and, and you just can't risk reputation. You have to have auditable compliant transactions. You have to do something sustainable. And you know, there's a point that we didn't get to earlier, which is one of the inadvertent side effects of the design of, say, Bitcoin is it not only rewards you for having very expensive, highly customized equipment, but it rewards you for having access to cheap power. So we see a situation where a lot of the nodes are located in authoritarian countries next to, say, cheap power plants, um, which not only hurts the environment, but it concentrates the nodes in places that are not good for trust. 
is a national security manner. If our financial system is based upon blockchain in 20 years, we need nodes distributed in Western democracies, emerging and transitional companies, not just concentrated in, in authoritarian places where power is cheaply available. And that's not only for the environment a good thing, it's good for national security and it's good for the trust of the system. So all of the, the predicates that Chia has are now the new minimum necessary requirements. And the way innovation works is there will be other blockchains. I mean, no one ever wins everything. Uh, but this was built to raise the stakes. And 20 years ago, uh, you know, a lot of the financial media wrote about the dot-com era as, oh, look at pets.com and how silly it is. But if you look at the GDP of, of countries and if you look at the market caps of the top companies, a lot of, these, a lot of this economy was built in that period. The same thing is happening today. I, I want us to move from covering Elon Musk tweeting about some scam coin and talk about what do we need as an infrastructure society to move forward in order to have this promise that we're talking about. Hmm. And I want to follow Gene? up that, you know, the interesting thing here too is uh, we once heard about a tech starter entity. They were doing kind of fantasy football for developers internally in Nigeria. And they decided to use Chia as the bidding currency. And people asked them why. And the answer was, well, our power is expensive. We can't afford to buy an Ant Miner 19, which starts for about $5,000 and ships in six months. But we have old hard drives around. And we were able to go actually farm some Chia. And now we're actual real participants in this network. And so it's that ability to create a global trusted, untrusted trust. It's, it's a really strange kind of concept, but what you're saying is that, you know, you could trade a carbon credit with someone you've never met and neither of you can, you know, do the deal badly. In the past, when we did, you went to Craigslist, you went to buy a Beanie Baby at McDonald's parking lot. You know, this was a scary transaction, right? You know, were you gonna be robbed? Was the guy, you know, gonna actually show up with a Beanie Baby? You're now talking about like, you know, for example, trading stocks and trading bonds with someone you've never met in a way that no one can actually, uh, you know, Screw the other person. That's a real change in what we can do. And by building an enterprise class blockchain infrastructure, they're going to build the Internet of Markets. So, you know, the whole point here with the client warehouse, for example, is to start building the foundation of a global cross border, cross market carbon credit market. And it's permissionless. It's one of the other things that's really important about a good blockchain. You know, if you're a carbon credit market in Europe and you decide, hey, wait, this is becoming the de facto settlement stage, you can just integrate to this blockchain without asking anybody, much less us. And that's an important point. So, you know, where we're headed is a world that instead of, I mean, it's kind of silly that stocks only trade from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. We're going to go to a world where everything trades 24-7, 365 with global liquidity. It's a very different kind of situation. And, and to date, we've kind of been hung up on just the money use case. You know, and I will say, blockchains aren't going to cure cancer. I hear too many people trying to claim that kind of thing. But blockchains are going to radically reshape how carbon credit markets, equities markets, debt markets, anything that can be tokenized and traded will be. And you both believe that anyone, anywhere, I mean, you mentioned Nigeria, can really have access to this and, and really benefit as well? So the, 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 the one application people have missed is that if you're in a non-OECD country, cross-border remittances are already heavily done in Bitcoin. You know, something like one in three Nigerians have Bitcoin. It's because of this. You know, when your brother in Brooklyn wants to send you money, the quickest and easiest way right now is to actually grab Bitcoin. We love that. We think that, that needs to be taken to the next level. It needs to make it even easier, even more global, even more liquid. You know, and, and I liken it a little bit to like the way that Africa skipped the wireline telephone and went straight to wireless. You know, here in the OECD countries, you know, we have a Chicago mercantile exchange. So, you know, if you're an American farmer, you can absolutely hedge your crop risk. But, you know, a lot of African nations that don't have that and having a global, you know, crop futures market that's available from their Android phone, that's a real game changer. And that's the things that blockchains are going to make available, finally. One of the great things about transformative platforms, which this is, which is why we talk about the Internet of Markets, is the applications and services are limited only by the ingenuity, creativity, and actual real-world problems that everyone faces. So I couldn't even begin to dream to tell you all the applications people will build over the next 10 years, but we need a platform for that to happen. 
All right. We have to leave it there, unfortunately, with both of you. Uh, quick discussion, but I'll definitely have to have you both back. David Frazee, uh, thank you so much for your time. And also Gene Hoffman, thank you both for joining me today.